Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. My guest today is the author of this book, which will be launched at a formal function in Bangalore on Sunday evening. It's called The Crooked Timber of New India, Essays on a Republic in Crisis. And let me tell you, you won't come across a more stinging, a more biting critique of the Modi government than in the essays in this book. Joining me now to explain his views and his opinion is the author, the well-known essayist, economist, and public affairs commentator, Parakala Prabhakar. Dr. Prabhakar, in the introduction to your book, you say of yourself, and I'm quoting, the primary intention of my writings and speeches is to raise a red flag when I see something going wrong, to draw attention consistently and with clarity to the failures, inefficiencies, falsehoods, and malafide intent of the government. So mine is an unabashedly critical voice. It is unrepentantly a dissenting no. So would I be right in saying that this collection of essays is not just a mission, it in a sense defines you. It's almost your raison d'etre. Current, may I say current? current? Of course, with um, pleasure. Karan, you know, this is an agonizing phase that we are going through in our country, in our republic. We have strayed very, very far away from the founding principles and the values of the republic. Now, what is happening now, the kind of discourse that we see in our, in our public life, the kind of politics that we see, the kind of uh, street scenes that we see in different parts of the country, especially in the northern India. And, you know, there is a there is a danger of that spreading into the uh, southern states also now. Now, this made me think, why did we come here? What led to this kind of a thing? And what is happening? And, uh, you know, why I say that I am an, an unabashed critique? There are, very, there are some people who would say, why are you criticizing? Don't you see anything good? And if you are criticizing, tell us what is the alternative. In that context, I said, yes, I am an unabashed critic. I do not have to earn the right to criticize only if I'm able to suggest an alternative. I believe, I'm sure any, any sensible citizen would believe that alternatives are decided by the people, not by you and not by me. We are only here to see and show what we see that, look, this is going wrong. This is not the kind of uh, values that we are wedded to during our long freedom struggle and in the constituent assembly debates, and the kind of constitution that we have given ourselves. Okay. Against that background, let's turn to how you view the present state of India and your critique of the Modi government. And I'll start with what you have to say about the economy. After that, I'll come to Hindutva. After that, I'll come to what you call Modi's obsession with power and other issues that you raise. But I'll go through them one by one so it's easier for the audience to follow. On the economy, you write, India is in fact facing a crisis. In terms of poverty, you say, for the first time since the 1990s, the number of people who are below the poverty line in India has increased. In terms of employment, you say, it's on a sharply declining trend. 
In terms of growth, you claim the economy is yet to return to the pre-pandemic level. Now, this is almost the exact opposite of what the Modi government says. In fact, its ministers boast about growth. They boast about creating jobs. They boast about reducing poverty. You're saying almost exactly the opposite of them. Karan, I would say that the government, the government ministers and the people who are speaking on behalf of the government or supporters of the government are really gaslighting. Now, let us see the, 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 the gross domestic product before the pandemic struck us and where we are now. We have not reached that stage at all yet. Now, even before the pandemic, we were in a continuous slowdown. I won't call it recession, but we were on a slowdown. Now, on top of that, we were hit by recession. And then we adopted very wrong policies. We addressed the supply side of the issue, not the demand side. We have all that stimulus was, has gone to the manufacturers who were supplying, who were manufacturing and supplying. To the, but you see, the, the point is the crisis was demand crisis, not a supply side crisis. So we have not addressed that. Because of that, today, our economy has not gone back to what it was even before the pandemic. One. Second thing is, now, the government ministers and the government spokespersons try to tell us that, you know, we are growing. And, you know, they, they tell But then where are we going, growing from? We are growing from a very, very low base before the pandemic and especially after the pandemic. Now, when you were already minus 27, and you post something, you know, which is a little in the positive, that looks quite big. Now, that is the kind of low base effect that is marketed and packaged and sold to us that is a high growth or fast growing. Now, in fact, Dr. Parakala, you go one critical step further. You say, and I'm quoting you, the nation's economic woes stem from the Modi regime's staggering incompetence. It has been unable to put together a well-thought-out, cohesive economic philosophy. Instead, you claim it's fallen prey to voodoo economists. Isn't staggering incompetence a little strong? And if you stand by that phrase, who do you have in mind? You see, one thing we should understand is, since the beginning, the Bharati Janata Party did not have a coherent, well thought out economic philosophy. This is something we must understand. I'm not talking about any particular individual, but then what is what is the what is the economic philosophy of Bharati Janata? Now, when it started in 1980, it said its creed was Gandhian socialism, if you remember correctly. Now, it opposed the 1991 reforms. It was very critical of them. Now, today, what you have is, as I call, voodoo economists advising the Modi government. They go in for something like a disastrous demonetization and tell us that was in order to fix the black money problem. Now, is black money in cash? Any, does any economist worth his sort or her sort tell you that black money is stacked in notes? That I understand. But can I ask, who are these voodoo economists? I don't know who they are. I don't know who advised uh, the prime minister and the government to go for demonetization. They are voodoo economists. But do they, you have the chief economic advisors in mind? I don't know if the chief economic advisors have really advised that. And I feel that anybody who has some kind of a training in economics, who had, who had uh, you know, uh, looked at any basic economics 101, also would go for something like uh, a demonetization. Let me repeat your precise phrase to you. The Modi regimes, please note, the Modi yeah. regimes staggering incompetence. Yeah. Who are you pointing your finger at? The Modi regimes. As a whole? Yes. Yes. You, you see, mean, today, I, today, I, today, 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 who is calling the shots in the government? Who decides the policy? It is the Modi. 
it is the modi government it's the modi regime no hang on a about, are you saying the prime minister narendra modi is staggeringly incompetent in economics uh well can i say a little further can i go yes. a little further yes. not only in, in economics in most of the things yes so I the prime that. minister is staggeringly incompetent in most things except except summoning the base divisive communal instincts that probably are somewhere buried deep inside the uh, social psyche of india but i'm just clarifying that is very, very that is that is very very competent you. let me just clarify for the audience because it's important no one gets a misunderstanding you're saying mr modi the prime minister is staggeringly incompetent in most things not just economics but most things yes i is that said it? That. did you yes. say yes yes i said yes what about the two finance ministers he's had in the first government it was arun jetri in the second government is nirmala sitaraman they are immediately in charge of economic policy are they staggeringly incompetent i do not want to comment on individuals this is this, this is not a comment on individuals this is not a comment on uh, personalities but you, but you commented I'm, on the I'm, pm but you commented on the pm because because, because, because he represents an era it is the regime that regime is very incompetent staggeringly incompetent except in mobilization of communal and hatred and uh, you know divisive uh, kind of a mentality yes okay your conclusion and i'm talking about your conclusion in terms of the modi government's handling of the economy is that the government has made a mess of the economy those are your precise words but aren't you overlooking the toilets and houses the government has built the subsidized gas cylinders it's given the healthcare and upi system it's created not to mention the work it's done in terms of roads electricity and direct benefits to farmers karan it's like this i'm not saying that you know there there's nothing good has happened they probably are but you see when you have about between six, hovering the the inflation figure is hovering between 6 and 7 and the unemployment rate is somewhere above 7 percent especially the youth unemployment is staggeringly high somewhere around beyond 18 percent and then if you tell me that you know there is a lot of uh, digitalization of currency there is this uh, some uh, uh, subsidy to you know a couple of things etc these are not in the same box it's it's made a mess especially if you look at the kind of rural distress that we are undergoing the kind of youth unemployment that we have today the kind of inflation that we have today and the kind of mess and bully headedness in terms of disinvestment in terms of uh, you know prioritizations about uh, different sectors addressing when the need was for addressing demand side addressing the supply side and trying to tell us that this is this this is a completely you know uh, a scattergun kind of a policy uh, initiatives let me take up something that the government at the moment is particularly proud of they speak a lot about it i'm talking about the success with apple phones as a result of the pli scheme last year india earned 5 billion dollars from apple phone exports which apparently is a fourfold increase over the year before 48 hours ago on wednesday the wall street journal reported that 19% of world smartphone handsets are made in india in fact the wall street journal article was on the front page and the headline was china has rival as a factory floor india being the rival do you not give them credit for this now if you then you should also look at if you are looking at uh, and taking pride in what the wall street journal says also look at the what what oxfam report says about the inequality in india now it is not I mean, let's not get into this kind of a neo liberal consensus and and see what wall street journal journal or you know financial times praises you for if you are looking at the kind of units or numbers of units that are produced by india the apple it could be samsung it could be smartphones it could be here but is that starting the real progress indicator 
Just for the sake of the audience, I'll point out the Oxfam report that I believe you're alluding to was about the sharp increase in inequality. And secondly, yeah. it was about how wealth was concentrated in a fraction of the country, whereas the vast majority had only a fraction of the wealth. That's the not, report. Not a, uh, now just to add to what you said, Karan, it's not just the, but you see, it's also the increasing concentration of wealth. It's not just concentration of wealth. It is the increasing concentration of wealth and increasing pauperization of a large section of our population. Which means that India is getting increasingly divided. A small fraction are getting increasingly rich. The vast majority are becoming increasingly pauperized. And this trend has gained momentum in the last seven to eight years. In other words, under Mr. Modi, this trend has become worse. Well, it has become worse under Mr. Modi, the Modi regime. But will that regime take credit for this also? I do not know. No, but you're blaming the regime for it. Yeah. Let's then at this point... They should, they, they should own it up. Let's then at this point come... No, no, the, 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 the Foxconn manufacturing of Apple phones is only one side of it, a very insignificant side of it, a very meaningless kind of a side of it. Okay. Let's then at this point, Dr. Parakala, come to your critique of Hindutva, which you call in your book, The Political Creed of the Modi Government. You write, and I'm quoting you, it thrives on skillful manipulation of the base instincts and socio-cultural insecurities that lie barely concealed beneath the political topsoil of the nation. I think what you're saying is that Hindutva plays upon and exacerbates the fractures and fissures that lie under the surface of our country. Also, I think you're saying that Hindutva legitimizes thoughts that were never expressed, but were in fact suppressed. Hindutva has brought them to the surface and given them legitimation. Am I right in that interpretation? I'm not very sure um, uh, if I understood really what, what exactly are you saying as, 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 as a summary of my thought. What I'm trying to say is that, look, this regime, its, its popularity rests on, not on its economic performance, not on its any other uh, indicator of performance, but in its ability to mobilize the population around a divisive communal Hindutva agenda. Now, Hindutva is very prominent in our political conversation today. For current, think about 10, 12, 15 years ago, or even 20 years ago, or just 10 years ago, the defining point of conversation political conversation in our country was secularism. Even the BJP used to say, look, we are secular, but genuine secular. Congress is secular, but it is pseudo-secular. All the other parties are pseudo-secular. We are genuine, genuinely secular. You see, the point is this I'm trying to make is that BJP about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, did not jettison the term secularism. It was not, it, it was still fighting shy to say that they are Hindutva votaries. That Today, has been jettisoned, that, that has been jettisoned under Mr. Modi. Completely, completely. In fact, and, you go further, and, and, don't and you? You say, uh, You're saying yeah. that the Hindutva plays upon what you call base instincts in our people. It plays upon our insecurities. It appeals to the dark side of us. Yeah, that's what I said. Now, I also, in, in, in another part of the book, I also talk about, now look, this kind of a, a psyche, this kind of insecurities, these kind of uh, fears, the fertile ground, most fertile ground for these to thrive was immediately after partition. Because you see, you had large numbers of population, transfer of population, you know, dead bodies coming from the other side of the border, dead bodies going from this side of the border, complete dislocation. And each one holding a grudge against 
not just individuals but larger communities that was the that was the most favorable fertile ground for the kind of politics that we see today but then it did not happen then if not let me quote the, that bit let me quote that bit of your book because i think it will be enlightening for the audience to hear your precise words you write it is puzzling that hindu majoritarian ideology is more acceptable today than it ever was even in the years immediately after partition and then you add the key to understanding the crookedness of the timber of new india perhaps lies in solving this puzzle but let me put this to you if hindu majoritarianism is more popular today than even at the time of partition surely mr modi will see that as his success he won't see it as a puzzle now it probably is is his success but then that is the trend that has to be arrested now if if somebody is a, a real unabashed votary of that kind of a politics that party or that collection that platform should have entered not like a trojan horse but completely as a votary of that particular creed isn't it but then 2014 the 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 conversation was not that 2014 the conversation was development clean government non corrupt platform and then i i say in some other part of the book also that mr modi went on saying in his election campaigns the fight is not between hindu and muslim the fight is of between unemployment and poverty on the one side and hindus and muslims together absolutely what you're saying is that hindutva was ushered in deceptively a facade was created by talking um, about economic economic issues about talking about commitment to democracy calling parliament the temple of democracy but behind that deceptively hindutva was ushered in that's the point you're making in your book it was smuggled in it was on the sly the But nation know, yeah it's sorry carry on the, the, the nation was not told what they were signing up for the problem dr parakar is that the nation has nonetheless accepted it i take your point it was ushered in deceptively by subterfuge and to use your words on the sly but let me quote again why i believe the nation has accepted it and i'm quoting from your book it is not from performance that the present dispensation draws and renews its political legitimacy and power it is from an assertion of hindu identity from the process of othering non hindu identities now i don't deny the veracity of what you're saying but doesn't this mean that the biggest percentage of voters the 37 38% that voted for the bjp in 2019 that's a minority was, perhaps but the biggest percentage i said i didn't say majority i said the, the biggest, biggest minority the I biggest said the minority point. it is i i would but say but let me finish let me finish let's let me finish the point i'm making is if hindutva has accorded mr modi legitimacy right then the biggest percentage of voters the 38% who voted for him and perhaps they voted as hindus agree and that is why in their eyes modi has become legitimate and that's the problem what mr modi is doing is happening deceptively it's appealing to the base instincts of indians and to the darker side of our character all of that is true but if the biggest percentage of voters agree and accord him legitimacy we have a problem no we we don't have a problem actually karan i look at it this way now what is the mission what is the goal and the and the and the aim of a leadership it is to see that the fissures are addressed harmony is 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 built not to appeal to the base instincts we all have base instincts don't we but that's not the that's not the role of the leader role of the leadership in the role an, of the leadership in an yes. ideal world you're right in an yeah. ideal world and and i am i am for be, an ideal world but the problem is that in the world that is not ideal by appealing to what you call our base instincts and our dark side 
Mr. Modi has established a rapport with the people, or at least a sufficient percentage to ensure he keeps coming back to power. That that again, that again is because of the first past the post system and territorial constituency, which I address in my epilogue. Must have, must have Absolutely. seen. Absolutely. But yeah. until but you then, but, but but then but then you see the the point is that you know uh, if if a leadership chooses to um, mobilize the electorate and the people around because after all today what we have is uh, a, a kind of democracy where mobilization of voters the largest whoever mobilizes the largest number of voters is in is in power now given that if if a leader chooses if a regime chooses if a political platform chooses to mobilize on over around a base instinct this has to be exposed and it has to be fought and it has to be defeated and that brings us to the incapacity of the opposition to actually take on this challenge and to actually expose what mr modi is doing as appealing to our base instincts rather than working for our development. But I'll come to the opposition in a moment's time. Before that, there's one more aspect of your critique of Mr. Modi that I'd like to take on board, and then we'll come to the opposition. You say, side by side with Hindutva is also the enormous power the Modi regime has acquired. You write, the Modi regime is obsessed with untrammeled power to do as it pleases. Democracy is a nuisance. You also say, Fear is a hard and visible reality today. And you add, never since the emergency of 75-77 has there been so much fear in society. In which case, let me put this to you. How do you respond to the fact that you can publish a book like this and say all those critical things about Mr. Modi which are there, including calling him staggeringly incompetent? And you can speak in this interview to me and both of us will remain free and people will say that proves Dr. Paraka is exaggerating. How do you respond to that view? Now, the point is this, Karan. Um, let me say this. I, I actually chose not to say this, but since you are you're very provocative into the culture, and uh, you are making me say things that uh, I decided not to say, but since you put it, and I do not want uh, the the viewers to you know uh, misunderstand you know what I have in my mind. You see. It wasn't easy for me to publish this book. I must say this. And I don't want to say anything more on it. This was not an easy thing to publish. It really took me a long time. And it really took me to, you know, I knocked at a lot of doors. And they were all very polite. <clears throat> they wouldn't straight away say no. They would say, we'll have to think about it. And, you know, we have so many lined up already. And, uh, you know, it could be after 2024. You're talking about means. publishers. You're talking about publishers. Exactly, yes. So it's, it wasn't an easy thing, number one. Number two, you know, freedom of speech is not what happens whether you are able to speak or not. Freedom of speech, the test for it is what happens after you speak. In so other words, the, the test the, the, will be what happens to you and me after this interview. The jury is out. Okay. Against this background, let's come to how you view the BJP. And after that, I'll come to the opposition. You're right. It is not burdened by constitutional norms and democratic niceties. And it's not averse to lying and deceiving. It is willing to use state institutions to advance its political goals. It does not hesitate to summon the dark elements that swim below the surface and to tap into the animosities and cleavages that lie dormant in a stratified and diverse society like India. Again, I'm not disputing what you've written, but the BJP proudly claims it is the largest political party in the country. It claims it has a membership of over a hundred million. Karan, let me what correct that, you. What yeah, does no, that tell it, us? It is the, they say it is the largest political party in the world. That's right. Did I not say that? No, you said India. My apologies. I meant in the world. And it has yeah. a membership, they claim, of over a hundred million. What then does this tell us about that membership? What does it tell us about that hundred million fellow citizens of ours who with their eyes open 
have consciously joined a party which, as you say, lies and deceives, which does not hesitate to summon the dark elements in our character, that taps into animosities, that doesn't observe constitutional norms and democratic niceties. What are we saying about 100 million of our fellow citizens who consciously joined such a party? You know, I, I am not with you when you say that if 100 million people say yes to something, that necessarily have to be right. I don't agree with that kind of a creed. Um, majority does not bestow an opinion with truth. Probably they might feel that today. Tomorrow they might not feel it. And you see, there are there are different categories of BJP supporters. And I've, I've dealt with that also. You know, I have no quarrel with people who genuinely believe that this kind of an agenda is good for India. I have a quarrel with them at an ideological level, yes. I don't agree with it. And I would put my counter arguments to that. But people who struck a Faustian bargain with this kind of a thing, because this is now on the rise. This is now the happening thing. Let us now you you, you see that all over the country, especially, especially in our even in our TV studios, in our uh, newsrooms, in our press rooms, in our newspapers, in our televisions, in our a lot of you know uh, uh, such uh, circles, you know, they have struck a Faustian bargain. But you see, the danger is that these people, when the regime, when when there was a previous regime, these people were with that regime. And can, can, I, can, I, can I interrupt and clarify for the audience what a Faustian bargain is? It's actually yeah. a bargain with the devil. It's exactly. a bargain with the devil. You, 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 you sell your soul and get a bargain so that you know, you you are you are you are you are comfortable. Your 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 career progresses, and uh, you know you make your money, etc. And you're saying that the majority of people who joined the BJP. No, I'm not saying the majority. I'm not saying the majority. It's a very there large is, there, is, there is a there is a significantly large number. But you see, they they have an outsized influence. They're influential. They write. They speak. You know, from places like where you are sitting, and uh, you know they, they 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 communicate. They're skillful. Okay, let's then at this point come to what you say about the opposition, because as I said in my introduction, you are bitingly and stingingly critical of the BJP. In fact, I said people will find it hard to find a critique that is more stinging and biting than yours. But you're also equally sharply critical of the opposition. And this is where that thought you alluded to earlier comes in. The failure of the opposition to credibly oppose Hindutva. You write, and I'm quoting you, the failure of the non-BJP political class is the main reason why our country today is a crooked edifice. The effective challenge should have come from political parties ideologically opposed to the BJP and its parivar. But they have failed us a long, consistent failure of vision, strategy, and energy. Let me put this to you. Many people would perhaps agree that this applies to Congress, perhaps even personally to Rahul Gandhi. But does it also apply to state chief ministers who won consistently in their states like Mamta Banerjee, M.K. Stalin, Naveen Patnaik, Arvind Kejriwal, Panari, Vijayan, Jagmohan Reddy, K. Chandrasekhar? They win in their states. Have they also failed, as you put it, in terms of vision, strategy, and energy? Okay. Let me ask this on my terms. First of all, I do not want to bring in any names. That's, that's always been my creed. It's not only the failure of the major non-BJP opposition, which ostensibly claims to be wedded to the founding principles and founding values of our constitution, to oppose, but also to fathom, to understand, to detect the kind of threat that was continuously, assiduously being built up over the years. This is something very important that I want to, I want you and and the the 
the the viewers and the listeners to to understand this. You see, when Congress UPA uh, won the election in two thousand four and two thousand nine. and before that there was uh, you know some kind of a uh, uh, you know musical chase between uh, uh, say congress and then uh, janata and then jm uh, janata dal and things like that everybody in this particular uh, thought uh, school of thought were complacent that an assault on the constitutional values Is, has died down, but that was not the case. Can I very quiet. What you're, yeah. can I, what you're saying is that opposition parties assumed that we can take India's secular, inclusive creed for granted, and that assumption was a terrible mistake. You put it much better than what I what I could say. I'm quoting you actually from your book. Yes, yes. You, you, that's precisely it. They have they've just they've, they've just taken it for granted that you know it is it is on a sec. secure foundation nobody nobody can really assault it it is beyond that so tell me something was this a mistake made out of confidence or complacency maybe complacency is a better word or was it a mistake made because they didn't actually realize the true character of the bjp which was it complacency or an inability to understand the bjp inability to understand bjp led to complacency both are both are right one the second thing and i i think it, it it adds to what what we have been talking about is that you know most of these political parties thought and still i'm afraid think that politics is election to election they are actually sleep walking from election to election but you see it politics is political sociology politics is political economy politics does not stand in a vacuum you know how the society is molded how the economy is molded you know these things really uh, make a huge impact on what happens in, in an election what I happens in, in a yeah. I, in a sense the point you're making is underwritten by something else you written in your book about the opposition you say the second mistake they made was doing business with the bjp i.e. supporting it either from the outside or supporting it from the inside as mamta banerjee and navin patnaik did even when they were ideologically incompatible with it in a sense in a sense like some of the members of the bjp who we earlier said were guilty of a faustian uh, pact so are these political parties the mamta banerjees and the navin patnaiks when it suited their interests supported the bjp under the facade of an atal bihari vajpayee then they broke free but they too did business even though they were ideologically incompatible with it and helped give as you put it they lent acceptability and respect to the bjp's illiberal ideology you know i'll i'll add something to what you said karan there was a time i'm sure you remember most of the 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 viewers also would remember there was a time not very long ago bjp's leadership always used to say look there should not be any political untouchability bjp is not an untouchable party bjp is a legitimate party now they were at that time their main idea their main goal their main aim objective was to get some kind of an acceptance that we are also you know a, a legitimate dignified uh we we also deserve a legitimate dignified presence at the table that's what they and you know um uh, that is the reason why they used to say we are also secular but we are genuine seculars now this this was the, the and you see when when political parties aligned to them with them as you said they have lent legitimacy to that i was actually quoting you it's not my words those were your words but Are you also going on to say that the Mamta Banerjees, the Naveen Patnaiks, the TDP that supported the uh, NDA alliance from the outside? I think it was he was he was also convener of the alliance. Did they realize 
that by doing so, not only were they giving legitimacy and credibility to an ideology that they opposed, but that they were helping create, and I'm using a word that I think you use, a monster that they'd never be able to defeat. You see, they, they could not size up. They could not size up what, with what kind of an animal they were dealing with. They lack of intelligence? Is this lack of intelligence on their part that they could it, size it, it up? Very, very opportunistic kind of a you know, okay, it, it it pays now, it pays in this election, it pays in that election. You know, I can have uh, some, some kind of a presence in the central government. I can have some kind of a two or three or four percent of vote, uh, you know, uh, addition to my uh, whatever kitty that I have already. This kind of very, very uh, utilitarian kind of a political, utilitarian kind of a considerations, which should not have been the case if they were really wedded to the founding principles and values and objectives of our republic. That's so what you're saying. They lost sight of. Now they they've also probably they've also misunderstood that you know BJP you know when they projected that will be a Vajpayee as its leader etc etc. Then probably they 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 thought that you know now now the now the polarization in Indian politics is one center left the other center right. But you're also saying, aren't you, Dr. Parikala, that opportunism, to use your phrase, and the pursuit of their own or their party's self-interest blinded them to the pitfalls of what they were doing by allying with the BJP and giving it credibility. It did. That's where, that's, that is the precise the reason why we landed here. You know, um, some of the people within the Parivar they did not try to conceal this kind of a thing. In fact, there was a very prominent leader from that uh, you know school of thought who said Vajpayee was a Mukhota. Govindacharya. That's the man. I think it's very important to name people because it's unfair to the audience to talk and not fully explain. It leaves the audience bewildered and that's not fair on them, which is why I named him. The truth is that's so, so the, the people have missed it. All the 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 the, the, the kind of uh, political formation that I'm talking about, those who are wedded to secular, plural, diverse kind of an idea of India, they 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 completely off center. They were misled. They saw an opportunity in in sharing the spoils of power rather than. Trying to look at, you know, what kind of an animal is this? Absolutely. But the truth is, Dr. Parikala, in these collection of... Par 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 Parakala. Sorry, my apologies. The truth is, Dr. Parakala, in these essays, you actually go one step further. You even blame the Indian people for what you call the crooked timber. When you discuss Hindutva, you write, and I'm quoting you, it is us as a people who must ultimately take the blame for this. And you say it again when you talk about the prime minister's lies. You write, the prime minister and his government get away with misinformation, ambivalent statements and plain lies because we as a people demand neither information nor accountability. I take it what you're saying is that we have the power to remedy and correct, but we're not using it. You see, um, I, I won't uh, put it the same way as you did. I'm not blaming. I'm being critical. There are two different things. I I could have made a mistake. I realize it. I'm critical of it. It's not a blame. I'm not blaming the Indian people. I'm only trying to voice, look, this is where you could have gone wrong. You had gone wrong, in my understanding. So let us correct that. Let us see what the reality is. What kind of a regime have we put in place because of our indifference? Because, uh, you know, we, we have not really sized up or because we were taken in by it, this kind of I huge... I accept your point. You're not necessarily blaming, although that's an interpretation that's legitimate. You're actually pointing out and criticizing. But in that criticism, you're also indicating to the people, subtly no doubt, that they have the power and capacity to correct things. Yeah, that shakti is with them. They simply yes. have to wake up and use it. Yes, yes. I, I believe in it. And that is the that is precisely the reason why 
I, I, I wrote this and I brought this out. If I, if I, if, if I, if, if I had not believe, if I had no belief that we could really change things, then th th this would be infectious. Okay. It would this have been, it would have been useless. Yes. This brings me to your conclusion, and to my mind, as I read the book, it's a two-part conclusion. To begin with, you write, and I'm quoting you: "Our democracy is in crisis. Our social fabric is torn. Our economy is in peril." and we are being dragged back to the dark ages. That part of your conclusion is your verdict on the Modi government. I stand by each and every word current of what I've said that there. We Let's... are being we are being dragged to dark ages. Look at the kind of you know addresses that uh, the government leaders are giving to the science congresses about you know um, about uh, plastic surgery and, and things like that and the kind of uh, um, you're referring to the prime minister october 2014 when he said that the fact that ganesh had an elephant head was proof that in fact plastic surgery and the, the so entire went on to say the fact that kunti was sorry karan was born through kunti's ear is proof that there was genetic science developed at the time but it wasn't set to a science conference i believe it was set to doctors at reliance hospital if i'm correct but never mind no, it, was no, it, was, it was it was in science congress but it is the prime minister october 2014 yes. let me then come to what i think is the second part of your conclusion and i think it's equally important as the first you say India is truly at a crossroads. It has to soon decide whether to allow the Hindu Hindutva narrative to overwhelm the country's political discourse completely or to aggressively and confidently reclaim the lost space for the idea of India as a liberal democracy that celebrates its diversity. This suggests that we have the capacity and we have at least one opportunity to change things and to give ourselves a better future. I strongly believe in that, Karan. Yes, we do have the, the kind of uh, strength. And it, at least now, the Republic allows us to you know, reject this kind of a narrative and bring back um, a, a narrative which is closer, which is in conformity, which is in harmony with the founding ideals of our Republic. Now, I see. I, I do not want to. I do not want to see what kind of a, what kind of a growth we have achieved. What kind of you said, you know, about uh, iPhones and you know Apple phones and things. Like that. I'm not talking about it. I'm talk, I'm not also talking about whether something is 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 economically uh, utilitarian wise, utility wise. Is it good or bad? Is it efficient? Is it not efficient? It's not that. I'm only talking about a society, a republic, which is just. That does not define you and me on the basis of our birth. Now, I have not chosen to be born in the, in the womb of a Hindu mother, nor have you. Nobody has chosen to uh, be born in a particular caste or in a particular region, that a particular language, a particular uh, nation, particular, uh, you know, uh, any of these things. It is an accident of birth. Now, just because of that, you want to lynch somebody? You want to treat somebody as second class? People who have been here for ages and ages and ages who are here, why, why should you discriminate? If that is the kind of, if, if that is the kind of fallout of a narrative that you are propagating, a narrative on the basis of which you are getting elected, a narrative on the basis of which you are enacting laws, acts, like the citizenship. Now, should it be encouraged or should it be rejected? This, is the, this is the start question before every citizen of India today. Absolutely. And that is why you say India is truly at a crossroads. And that is why you believe we have the Shakti, we have the capacity to change things, provided we are prepared to use it. Let me then end the city rule by asking you one last question. What would happen if Mr. Modi and the BJP win a third term in 2024? I have to tell you, many people believe that's more than likely. Even in fact, I myself say that in the in the book. In which case, what will happen to India? 
I think it 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 goes down even deeper, deeper into this kind of a. Uh, what is going down even deeper mean? What sort of country will we become? Well, we have seen all the signs now. Uh, it 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 could end up uh, as a theocratic state. It could end up as a Hindu Rashtra. It could end up uh, where people who do not belong to the majority religion will have to content themselves with being second class citizens. Can I and, can I put it like this? Would a third victory for Mr. Modi and the BJP spell disaster for India? It does. Yes. Do you accept that word disaster? You accept the word disaster? Yes. Uh, uh, Is there a stronger word? What would you prefer? Um, You you, you tell me. It's going to be a a huge disaster. It is going to be a disaster for India, for the idea of India, for a a, a lot of people who do not... You see, it it is not going to be a democratic country. It is not going to is going to be a secular country. It is not going to uh, respect diversity. It is one nation, one political party, one religion, probably one language. It sounds to me. So, if so, so every 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 other every other the othering is in danger. Tell me, it sounds to me as if you're saying a third term for Mr. Modi is not just a disaster, it will spell the end of India as we know it, as we love it. End, end of end of idea of India, yes. Which was rooted in our freedom movement, which was re- rooted in our constitution, which was rooted in the initial stages of the shaping of our republic okay. and our nation. Yes. Dr. Parakala, and my apologies for having mispronounced your name accidentally in the middle. Dr. Parakala, I'm deeply grateful for this interview. This is a book which I think will be extremely controversial, but it also needs to be widely read. And there are few people who have had the guts to say openly and repeatedly, because you said it twice on this program, that Narendra Modi is staggeringly incompetent, not just in economics, but as you said, in most things. I thank you for your openness. I applaud your courage. And I hope and pray you stay safe. Thank you very much, Karan. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.